All right, this is a Pro Wrestling Illustrated podcast. I'm your host, PWI senior writer, Al Castle, without my co-host for the moment, Brian, I think, and I hope will uh, join me soon. Uh, but in the meantime, I am joined by Patricia Rogers. Did I get that right? Yep, that, that is my government. People know me in the podcast <laughs> space as Queen PR. <laughs> Patricia Rogers, and, and she's joining us for the first time uh, because we're going to be talking about the women's 250 which is something we've wanted to do for quite a while but i didn't want to do it without a woman here and uh not only do you fit the bill but you're actually uh we're, we're part of the ranking committee that put the women's 250 list together so thanks so much for uh joining us what what but before we get much into it why don't you tell uh, people a little bit about yourself and uh you've got a pad podcast yourself and, and a pretty popular one I do, I do. So uh, shout out to my partner in crime, Krista B. We just celebrated five years of our podcast, Those Wrestling Girls. It is focused on women's wrestling and it has always been an honor to work with PWI. Kevin has been an, a, a friend of the podcast since the very He's beginning. Okay. Um, <laughs> and um, so, yes, yeah, so I'm one half of Those Wrestling Girls. I've been a wrestling fan my entire life. Um, I've worked in media for the past 10 years. Um, I work at the U.S. Sun now, and I'm actually starting some wrestling content there, which is very, very fun, very interesting. Um, but yeah, I've, I've been in this space for five years now. I've gotten a chance to work on a lot of different podcasts. I just love um, collaborating and being able to work with PWI has been a true honor. Um, so if you haven't checked out those wrestling girls, please do. Uh, this is the second year I've been on the women's committee for PWI. Last year, 150, of course, this year going up to 250. Um, and it's always fun because, we, you know, we were talking before we started recording about just learning about how much wrestling there really is out there. Um, so I like to think of myself as a women's wrestling aficionado, but there's always like so much to learn. Uh, sure. So please check out our platforms and the new issue of PWI. If you haven't already. Yeah, absolutely. I, I've been part of the uh, PWA 500 ranking committee now for as long as I've been in the magazine, which is whatever, 17 years. I don't think I've actually, maybe I have, but I've forgotten if I've ever sat in on one of the, the women's um, ranking issues. So I'm curious, what, what what's that like? I mean, um, I know this year the 500 um, a meeting, at least for deciding number one, was pretty heated um contentious i'd say how was it um picking a number one for the women so that it's funny because uh last year when i was on the ranking committee i didn't get a chance to go to all of the meetings it was more just me giving my input via email this year was the first time i was able to get on a call with kristen um and um Candace, yes, yep. And, yep, yep, and all the rest of the committee. And I remember them saying, like, wow, this is like the most uh, easygoing committee meeting that we've had because I guess last year it got pretty heated. Um, but it's interesting too because everyone kind of comes with their own perspective and their own. Um, I don't want to say bias, but everyone likes what they like. Wrestling is what it is. You know, everybody likes who they like. But when it comes down to the criteria, that's when things get kind of testy because it's like, yep. yeah, we all love, you know, uh, Mercedes Monet, um, but she didn't rank this year. She didn't hit the criteria. So that's when things get a little like kind of testy because it's just like, okay, how can like the most popular women's wrestler in the world right now not be on this list? But it's like, that's why there's criteria. So it really just kind of like humbles everyone in their fandom because it's just like, okay, I know what you like. I know what promotions you watch, but did they do this? Yeah. Um, and the other aspect of being on this committee as well is, is just how many, how much wrestling is like not on everyone's radar. Cause like to come up with 250 women to rank, you kind of have to think of even more than 250. And, I'm, and, right. and for me being someone that loves women's wrestling, like the fact that there are even 250 women that can be ranked on the best wrestlers of the world was just like. You know, the whole time I'm just like, I can't believe this is happening. This is amazing. Um, but it's a pretty, it was a pretty cool committee. It did get testy at times, but I think <laughs> when it came to like number one, I think we all were kind of in agreement that Rhea Ripley sort of had, you know, it was kind of like her year. Um, 
And then, of course, where Bianca Belair ranks, because last year she was number one, and it's like, wait, hold on, she's number three, and now we're giving, like, you know, Julia, a, a woman from a totally different landscape, you know, is number two, but again, it's that, that opportunity to learn, like, someone that's going to look at this list is going to, you know, who only watches WWE, let's say, or only watches Impact, or, or whatever, they're going to look at this list and say, like, who the f is Julia, um, <laughs> And you know what I mean? And it was like, wait, now there's a learning opportunity there. So I think just getting past that whole thing, um, you know, was a learning experience within itself. Yeah, it's a really good point. Obviously, you know, I, I've seen it on the 500 side and, and um, you know, I know Brian's uh, brought it up and, and you're right. I mean, the reality is that that the the base of our readers are American wrestling fans and, and those are going to be largely WWE, AEW fans. So on the 500 side, you throw uh, somebody like uh, El Hijo de Vikingo in the top 10 and it's like, who? You know, and... Um, you know, I, I I think it's pretty honest to say, even on your part, I imagine you weren't that familiar with some of the people who were coming up. You know, w were you resistant to it when, when you see, you know, the discussion about Julia, who's maybe somebody you're not so familiar with, um, all the way at number number two? Do you need some convincing? I did. <laughs> I did, only because it's hard to not put, like, Bianca Belair higher or, you know, someone like an Athena, who I think it has been one of the best women's champions this year. And it's so underrated in so many different ways. So it's hard for me to, like, you know, especially being a fan of her since the very beginning. And then, like, this new person I've never heard of is now number two. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, it, it, did, it did cause some sort of, like, okay, you're going to have to, like, convince me. But, you know being on that committee with so many like talented people is like, or knowledgeable people, I should say, they're like, no, 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 Julia is, you know, she's done this, she's done this, she's done this, and she's next. I'm like, okay, this is why, this is why I like being on this committee because now she's, I'm now alert to what she's doing and I'm tuned all the way in. Um, yeah. So, you know, when things like that happen, yes. Um, one name that um, kind of was very much contested a lot was Camille. Okay. And that's because, so like a lot of people consider her to be like under an underrated champion or one of the most like defending champions in the NWA. Um, and I always thought like, why don't people talk about her more? Like she defends it, you know, she holds it with honor. Um, she puts on really good matches. Like she is like what, you know, what you would want your champion to be. But then you have other people that don't care for NWA and they're just yeah. like, what? Like Camille? <laughs> She could be like number 25. So it, it, you know, those instances is why I got into, I guess, wrestling podcasting, wrestling media for women, because it's like, I love that we're arguing for them. If that makes sense. It's like, you know, Absolutely, yeah. you may not feel like they are, but I love the fact that I can argue many, many points of why she should be in the top 10. Um, so those moments are, you know, really special. Like Willow Nightingale, like even mm -hmm. I would say, I think, her ranking is very high. Um, I think she is just getting started. Like she's like white hot now, but it's almost like, where does she work up to? Like yeah. if, if, if she had one good year, one good calendar year and she's already in the top 10, it's like, what does she work up to? But then there's other people are like, how could she not be in the top 10? And there's also that bias factor where it's like, she's very, very likable. Yeah, so I yeah. Angel wrestled, wrestled like for years before she made it, and she's very likable. And I'm like, okay, if you guys want to be the top ten, I'm not gonna argue with you. You know what I mean? So those instances are interesting, just from coming from just like being, uh, you know, someone a part of wrestling media is concerned. Yeah, yeah. Will lives in my neighborhood, and um, I know, and and is a, a piercing artist nearby, and I know somebody who is looking mm -hmm. for a piercing. And I was thinking, like, oh, I should get a hold of her. How cool would it be to, to get right? be pierced by one of the top ten uh, women's wrestlers in the world? My my perspective on the list that's that's really interesting is um, so I I write the top ten, but but I'm not part of the ranking committee. So it it's a, an interesting challenge to me because I'm given like a list, right, and then I'm told like, you know, write up why these ten women are the, are the top ten. And in some cases, I'm not even super familiar with these women, and so. It is as as much studying as I have to do for anything uh, all year. I mean, obviously, with like the 500, I'm a lot more familiar with the people I'm, I'm writing about. I do the top 10 for that, too, and, and for the uh, the tag team list. 
Uh, but, you know, you, I know who Julia is and, you know, through working um, on the magazine, I become familiar with, with her work. But if I could, you know, if you ask me, grab the top five highlights of her year, I mean, I have got no idea. So it's it's digging in and it is fun and, and, and because it is kind of like this education and you do realize that there are these amazing women out there that maybe you're not that familiar with. You, you mentioned Athena and... To me, I'm thinking like, oh, yeah, former Ember Moon. I know AEW signed her a couple of years ago. You know, I don't know if she belongs in top 10. And then you dig into her year and I was blown away, you know, um, like by just the the, the, the the level of work and productivity. I, was, I mean, it's week after week after week after week uh, defense. I mean, if anything, there could have been an argument for, for her being even higher on the list. That's how impressed I was uh, by her. But I think it's great. You know, it, it sounds like the, the you know, the, the reality is that in the magazine and, and in all places, you, you as you touched on, you've got people who have got their favorites and um, uh, maybe like a certain style of wrestling more than others. You've got like the Joshi fans in in, um, uh, in PWI and on the ranking committee. And I think it's it's great to have the perspective of, an American wrestling fan who who I think is going to come in and say, "Hey, look, Bianca Belair is super popular. She's a a big star." Is that kind of what you're bringing to the table, like a reminder of like, yes, Julia can be great, uh, or Tam Nakano can be super awesome, but Bianca Belair is like a big <laughs> big deal. Yeah. Oh, uh, and I I do you know I recognize that I came in with that not like that particular knowledge or sort of the WWE women or like the impact and the AEW women, like I totally understood that part of it where the, when the conversation came up to talk about uh, uh, Tam Nakano, um, where I was like, you got it, <laughs> you know, yeah. like teach me, you know, why they deserve to be on this list. And as someone, I think it's also very interesting coming into this committee, being on last year's committee. And I'm sure you have this thought too, where first of all, time goes by super fast. Mm -hmm. sure. Like, how are we already um, talking about this list? And then also, you can remember where someone ranked last time and why. So then when you come and revisit this committee, you're like, okay, I understand why Athena may not have, you know, cracked the top half. But now, I, in my mind, as I'm watching her through the year, I'm like, okay, now I see what she's doing. Now I can't wait to rank her higher next yeah. year. Or um, because, in, you know, in WWE, which is what I watch primarily, you're kind of not supposed to care about these lists, per se. You know what I mean? Like, you're not supposed to, like... Until they rank high, you know? Like, you won't hear anything yeah. about the 500 you're until one. you're number one. one. <laughs> yeah. But uh, these wrestlers, though, they care about this list. They care about this ranking. And they, you know, I think the, the criteria, too, is something to note as well. Because a lot of people read the list and they just complain. And it's like, it's not a cat. It's not January to December. You know, read right. the criteria. It's from a certain amount of time. You have to win a certain amount of matches, singles matches. Like the criteria is very specific. Um, so when I'm watching wrestling throughout the year, I'm like, ooh, like I was watching Ray Ripley. I was like, mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I can see her, <laughs> I can see her yeah. being number one. Like, you know, she's getting there. And I love the fact that, like, I wrote Ray Ripley off a few years ago when she yeah, i did to too I, I you know i mentioned this uh on on a recent um you know podcast where it seemed like there, this Rhea, uh, ripley experiment has been going on for years and it, it and you know frankly i think wwe and some of the decision makers there saw something before i saw it because you know i it, whether it was wrestlemania 36 whichever the, oh. the the covid one was or after that they kept on putting her in these high profile COVID wrestlemania year. matches and, and i was like i don't know that i i mean like you know a, a really good in the ring really solid but i just wasn't getting it and this past year and i think you have that moment with all great wrestling stars where they sort of find their voice i mean the the cliche is is Steve Austin in the Austin 316 promo. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, that's what happened with Rhea this year and with Judgment Day. I think like all the stars align and we and we saw the the total pack package, the right presentation of her. And I think she's fantastic now. I mean, I think she's one of the highlights right. of, of all of WWE programming. No, I, I absolutely agree. So like and that and that's the joy of it is the fact that I that we wrote, we're like, we're like, really, really? really? And now mm -hmm. it's like undeniable. It's like yeah. of course she's number one. The same thing with like yeah. I, I never counted out Bianca Belair. 
But I, even myself, you know, three, four years ago, didn't see her being the number one women's. Because that's how I look at, like, agree. She's yeah. Is the number one women's wrestler in oh. the world. I did not see that. I did not see Bianca Belair. Hey, Brian. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, guys. That's all right. Sorry, we're in the middle of no, no. By the way, it's fine. We're we're just in the middle of talking uh, about the women's two fifty, and um, yeah, I mean, fascinating stuff. We we're just talking about uh, Rhea Ripley and and how we just talked about this, Brian, uh, at the last podcast. How you know some folks, myself included, were a little kind of slow on the come up on 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 Rhea. Like I I, I didn't buy it right away, and and you touched on uh, Bianca also. I remember you know Bianca getting called up to the main roster and then the rumor started pretty early on she, you know whether she's going to win the rumble or or headline wrestlemania and i was like really you know i mean like i i think she's really good but but really so you know the 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 part that's really reassuring about that is that it means that and i don't know if this is paul Levesque, i i think it is um just really has a, a really good eye for talent because he's see he's seeing this before we're seeing it and that's the way it should be right right yep and i'll i don't know if you remember but i'll i'll toot my horn again and say that i saw it in the may young classic and i think i told for, you that for Rhea or for bianca for bianca yeah i, I remember that's you first remember time I saw we, her. yeah we i was really impressed too but i don't know that i would have called this for, for when bianca. i i saw her in the may young classic and I think it was the first one that she was in the yeah. first one, right? And I just, I don't know what it is. I was just like, this, this is a special kind of talent. I, I could just, I could just feel it. And it was, it was the whole presentation, the music, the whole, it was like, I could just tell that they put a lot of work into it. I could tell that they had big plans for her. It was just yeah. something that came across. And I, I, just in that particular time. But as far as Rhea goes, I think, you know, it's interesting. I think like you were saying, um, being a little bit kind of catching up on it and, and sort of like being late to the party or so to speak, I was having a, a, a conversation about this exact thing with somebody. And I think part of the reason is that with somebody like her and especially in a company like WWE, you have to look beyond the, the traditional booking because somebody was saying to me, Oh my God, it's, I don't know what the big deal is with Rhea. This has been a very lackluster, like women's title reign. She hardly defends it. It's just like, I don't know. What has she done since she's become champion? And I'm thinking, and I'm going, okay, at the same time that you can say, all right, maybe it hasn't been the most amazing women's championship reign ever, but you're missing the bigger picture. It's like it, 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 it's more than that. It's everything. It's how she's presented. It's the fact that she's clearly the biggest star in in Judgment Day. No, nobody wants to say it, but she's the leader. We all yeah. know she's the leader. I mean, we, it, she's so much the leader. We don't have to say she's right. The who's who's the one who sat down with Paul Heyman? Right, it was her. She's yeah. the, it, it's almost like a running gag right now that the other guys don't want to admit that she's the leader. So it's, but it's also organic, saying, right? I mean, it's, yeah, it's right, not just right. like she's cast as, as the leader. It's that she's the leader. I mean, she she feels like she, she carries right. herself like it. Yeah. She just sort of like emerged as the leader. And, and it's, you know, she's one of the most over wrestlers that WWE has, male or female. Yeah. She's definitely, in my mind, the most over, um, you know, w women's wrestler in the United States. And I feel like that, so that's why you got to take more, you can't just have that traditional way of looking at it like, oh, who she defended it against and what, you know, has she had any classic matches since she's won it and all that. And, and all that's debatable. You have to look at the whole overarching package. And with her, it's it's not even a question to my mind that she's she's at the top. Yeah. Patricia, right. what, what do you see as the money women's match in WWE? Is, is it Bianca and Rhea? Yeah, I think so. I think it has to be them. It has to be a singles match. It has to be where Bianca is kind of, I don't want to say working her way back up, but she has to get to a point where we're like itching for her to be champion again. And then it's like, okay, the only thing in her way is like Rhea Ripley. And then they go head to head. Um, but I also like the news things that's been happening. Like uh, Kyrie Sane is back, Asuka. Mm -hmm. Like there's so many, um, or even just like everyone that Rhea Ripley defended her championship against in Saudi Arabia. Like yeah. the fact that there are so many like 
I call them like hard hitters, like a Zoe Stark and a. I think a Zoe's great. Yeah. Right. Like that might be it. Like it might be going to kind of like where we don't know where it's going and that be like that next big feud for Ray Ripley. Um, but it makes sense for it to be like Bianca Belair. And I also nope. love to like the lack of. You know, of course we have Bailey, but I like that there's so many more women besides the four horsewomen that could mix it up with Ray Ripley and it'd be yeah. the match. It, it, I think it would have to be Bianca Belair. It's you know, we talked about this in the last podcast, and and it is um it, it it's sometimes a little confusing, but it's also one of the things that that makes the women's division in WWE and I think women's wrestling in, in general so so interesting is that there is so much turnover, right? I mean, you look at the top ten of the list this year and you compare it to last year. And the turnover is huge. I mean, I, I think there's maybe two names that are on on both top tens, and and there are are big big stars who are not in the top ten. I mean, you're not going to find Charlotte there. You're not going to find Becky Lynch there, and uh, and and a lot. You know, Britt Baker is not there. And these are some of the biggest names in, in women's wrestling. What do you think is is behind that? You know, is it that women's wrestling is still in in the grand scheme of things kind of a relatively new phenomenon, and so uh, promotions are still kind of trying to figure out, you know, who really is a star. Sadly, I, I do, I do believe that. I think we have come a long way, but there's always that, like, you know, that sideshow aspect of like the women's matches on the shows, where yeah. you know it's notable if there's more than one or two women's segments or matches on the show. Like it's like you know, of course, my feed is all like women's wrestling fans for the most part. They notice like, okay, we have this, we have this, we have this. I I still think because I I don't know why it's not possible for there to ever be a wrestling show or a PLE or a pay per view or whatever where it's fifty fifty where it's like five women's matches, five men's matches. Like, why is that never the case? Like, I I never understood that. And I never understood, you know, why does it have to be a novelty for that to happen? Because the women are bringing it just as much as the men. Like, it's almost like, um, you know, I don't even want to get into, like, AEW's women's division, but, uh, <laughs> you, you, like, you just said, like, Ray Ripley is the undisputed leader of one of the most popular factions in the company and it's still like not a thing so it's like what like what why not so i'm but, always gonna like kind of like push for that to be the case but i think it's always you know wrestling is is, is you know male dominated it's um very rooted in a lot of like old school tendencies so it's gonna be a long time before we get that 50 50 um but i do feel like we're making a way like ray ripley a lot of her um, and I want to get into like the criticisms on her, her, her championship run, but you know, we've seen her mix it up with the guys. We've seen her, she's the one that sat down with Paul Heyman. You know, she gets in, you know, when someone, you know, messes with Dom Dom, she's the one that steps up and is like, okay, like what, what's going on? So, you know, we see it, but it's not all the way there, but I'm always like pushing for it. Yeah. WWE, you know, certainly since China has been reluctant and I understand why to do the intergender stuff. Yeah. I, I think they're testing the waters a little bit with Rhea. I mean, they've come as close to getting there with anybody um, as they have with her. And I mean, they got no qualms about Rhea beating up men, but the men won't return it. And uh, oh, Brian, do you think at some point, you know, that dam is going to break? I think that, uh, well, I mean, WWE is, well, I should say AEW doesn't do it either. I guess, uh, you know, there, there are plenty of companies that do it. I, you know... I'm not the hugest fan of it for a bunch of different reasons. It's like, but I do think having said that, that there can be exceptions. I think China was a clear exception. I think somebody like Rhea Ripley is for me. It's got, look, we all know it's not, you know, a real sports competition. Otherwise we would, it wouldn't even be a question. You know, we're not going to have men beating up women and all that stuff. It's a performance, but you still want to create the illusion. You want people to be able to suspend their disbelief. And so that's why I say it's the same thing, like, because people will say to me, well, how do you feel about how come you're OK with Rey Mysterio, you know, wrestling right. the big show and The Undertaker? And I'm like, first of all, who says I am? That's first of all. <laughs> Second right. of all, it's it's great if it's a novelty like that was part of his gimmick that right. he's like David and Goliath. He's oh, my God, he's going to stand up to this big. Can he do it? Oh, wow. That's the whole angle of the match. But like. 
you know, I, I went to an indie show once and I saw uh, when Darby Allen, before he came to W uh, to AEW, he was wrestling Wrecking Ball Ligurski, who you may know from the NWA. The man is like a walking planet, okay? He's gigantic. And they worked their match. There was no underdog. There was no, like, I'm the little man, you're the big man. They were just working in a style as if they were the same size. And it looked ridiculous. Um, it just looked ridiculous. He's selling. You got this giant guy selling for little Darby Allen, and it just doesn't look good at all. So that's my only holdout. Like, for a, for a woman to step in the ring with a man, she has to convincingly look like she can kick his ass, if I could say that on the PWI yeah, it, podcast. And, like, yeah. for example, somebody, uh, uh, you know, it's the first person that comes to mind, like a, a Sasha Banks. She is not somebody. That I could, if she's in there with Roman Reigns, <laughs> I am not going to think, oh, wow, could she win this? Yeah. If Rhea Ripley is in there with Roman Reigns, I might think she could win it. That, at least in the, especially in the world of wrestling, where you suspend your disbelief, there's got, like, you got to meet me halfway. It's, right. it's, it's like the same thing if you're putting in a light heavyweight or a cruiserweight with heavyweights, you do it sparingly for a very, a storyline reason that makes sense. I think it's the same with intergender. You can't just, to me, you can't just do it all the time. You can't make it a regular thing. Some companies do that where just women wrestle men, and that's just the way it is. It's got to be for a reason. It's got to be with the right people, and then I think you could do it. And she definitely is the right people. But even with her, though, you don't want to do it all the time or it loses right. the novelty. It's true. I, I, I'm a fan of intergender wrestling only because I got more into the indies, and that's really, like, all you get in the mm -hmm. indies. Because women train with men, that that that's the reality. Right. So so it's not foreign to the women. Right. Every you know, you talk to uh, every you know successful women's wrestler, basically any women's wrestler in in the United States, mm -hmm. their training involved bumping around with men because that's mostly what there is. Exactly, but I just I never saw it in WWE. Like no, I, no. I'm one of those people. It just does not fit for me. And 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 if you think about it, as much as I love China, like that was where a lot of the discrepancy came, like with her in the company. Where it's like, okay, do you keep, uh, do you keep wrestling men? Because we're not going to give you the world championship. Yeah, yeah. It's just women. really fraught. Like, yeah. There's only like, right. There's only yeah, so far like, you could go. Right. Doing exactly. it now, it, like yeah. impact, it's like I don't know. It's just different. I don't know why, but like you kind of accept it more. Um, like uh, Trinity and Sunny Kiss. You know, I don't know if you, you know, that gets complicated, but like that was an amazing match. I don't see yeah. that happening in AEW or WWE. It can only well, Impact happen. put the world title on a woman, remember, some right. years back. Oh. That was this big experiment. And, you know, I don't I don't know. I mean, I, when they did it, I, I, I thought it was a worthwhile move from a, a PR standpoint, get a little attention. I mean, kind of like, why not? It's not right. like they were setting the world on fire back then. And Tessa Blanchard was, was a really good talent um, at the time in the ring. I know she has her, her issues. But also, yeah, I mean, in some ways, it kind of like stretched credulity to see, you know, Sammy Callahan bumping all over the place for, for Tessa yeah, Blanchard. Well, that's the kind of thing that I mean. And, and then like, okay, if you take it that far and you go that far, then can the men wrestlers compete for the women's titles? I mean, that would yeah. just, it would make well, no sense. But that, what I will, I don't know if, if this is common knowledge. I think it is. I think this has gotten out there, but there was talk, serious talk of putting the WWE title on China. Um, that I think that is something that Vince Russo seriously considered. Yeah. It was, it was on the table and it was, it was shot down. They just felt like it was going too far, but it was definitely in consideration. Wow. Uh, uh, Patricia, you know, that, that maybe is a good segue for another topic. And um, w we've seen, you know, in the time I've been at the magazine, it grow from the, the, the 50 to the 100, 100 and now we're up to, to 250, uh, w which is great. And, I, and, and I'm sure, as you touched on, even with 250, there's tons of super talented women's wrestlers that don't make the list. At the same time, we've seen uh, uh, women in bigger numbers included in the PWI 500. And this always, you know, creates something uh, of, of a debate. And I'd be curious where you stand. And, and over the years, there's been discussion. Do you just make one list, you know, and, and uh, it, it is just 500 wrestlers, you know, uh, regardless of gender, the, the 500 best wrestlers in the world. The reality is that would mean leaving even more people out of it. 
you know, unless you do a, a 1,000, and, and I can imagine what our summers would look <laughs> like. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. It would be a mutiny. <laughs> um, but, but, but where, you know, uh, and I got to say, I, I, you know, I, I've got mixed feelings uh, on it. And w w where I think it's like, on one hand, I understand the idea that if a, a woman is competing against men and, um, you know, has a a solid record working against men, then why should be she be um, considered any differently than than men working against the same men? But it's complicated because I think when we're looking at the the five hundred, it's like all right, she this woman worked with some men, so she makes the list. But then you're also taking into account kind of the overall overall um, win loss record, which includes work with women. I I just think it's it it, it we're still working our way through it. I'd, I'd be curious what your thoughts are. So I, I was thinking a lot about that once the list went up to 250 and knowing that there are women included in the 500 list. But I think it's one of those things where um, there has to be a separate list to give women that platform. Like for PR reasons, there have like we have to tell people like there are now 250 women that are considered the best in the world as opposed to 150 and 50 like that it's important for us to like kind of know that um but then for the women that work the indies that only work with men that are on the 500 list to me that makes like perfect sense but there is going to become a time where it's going to get it's going to kind of be where there should just be like one long list but then i'm also like you know does I love celebrating women. Like I love celebrating. I love yeah. that platform. So I would never want to just, you know, because we were just making the point before where like why are there never wrestling cards with 50-50 women's matches and men's matches? So that with that being said, then there has to be a separate list for women. There has to be that, you know, that flag to say like there are this many women. There has to be that flag that says like there was 50, but that list is too small now. Now there are 250. It has to be that for the growth. You know, I think about all the women now, cause you know, now we're in 2023, the four force women have now been wrestling for 10 years. Now you have girls coming up where they inspired them. So now I'm thinking all of the women that are going to look at this 250 list, like I'm going to be number one one day. I'm going to be number one one day. Now, not everyone is going to be in the landscape to be number one. On the, not every woman is going to be wrestling in the landscape to be number one on the 500 list. It just, it is what it is. Like, you know, there's not intergender wrestling in every, the biggest wrestling promotion in the world, WWE. So it's hard to say like, I want to be number one in the 500 as a woman's wrestler, but right. if I am coming up, I want to now be number one on that 250 list. Now what I would love to see is a 250 list go up to 500. Now, <laughs> and, and if you think about it, like, you know, but if you I, did that, what would, would that, and I think this is already a question that needs to be considered does that mean no longer allowing women in the PWI 500 at, at some point, you know, is there a question of fairness if you could be on both lists? See, that's when, <laughs> that's when it gets hard because I know a lot of women on the, you know, on certain circuits that only wrestle men. Mm -hmm. So it's like, do we put them in the women's 250 or do we put them on the 500? Like, I, I think it, it more comes down to like what criteria you want to go into, but I, I agree with you. It does come to like, okay, is it fair? Like, can I be on both lists? Like what list do you, you know, what list do you come? But I think the way the world is moving at one point, point there is going to just be like the 500 or you know best wrestlers in the world period but i think like right now there has to be kind of like that separation we have to be able to elevate women separately and give them that list because of the fact that like there was a point where that list didn't exist so we yeah. have to we have to say like you know what there are this many women that we're considering like i love the fact that you know i'm looking at this spreadsheet and i just had a moment as someone that grew up in the attitude era who was inspired by what the women are doing now to start a podcast to be like holy shit like there are 250 women that were just more than that <laughs> you know, exactly exactly that yeah. we have to now have to like go into so you know 
That's a really hard question, and I'm yeah. sure I get a lot of different answers, but I do think for now it's important for us to highlight the women that are killing it in the industry, like a Rhea Ripley and, you know, a, a Julia and that, that knowledge as, aspect. Because I do feel yeah. like if we were to merge the list, Julia may not have made it. And I'm just using her as an example mm-hmm. because she's number two and she's someone that I wasn't necessarily familiar with. So, yeah, you know, it, it's hard. It's what, hard. What what's funny is that I and I think you sort of touched on this. It like it this is so hard now and so kind of complicated and like fraught with all these these problems. And you know in in 10 years when wherever we're at, we're gonna look back on this and think like that really wasn't so hard. <laughs> like what was the big deal? And and it's already that way now when I mean if if 10 years ago there was dis- a discussion of a women's royal rumble. You know, people would be pulling their hair out. How are you going to do a Royal Rumble with with thirty women? You know, kind of an outside of of wrestling example. Uh, my kids were in uh, Cub Scouts for a number of years, and my kids were in the program when they let girls in, um, and it was separate the Girl Scouts. It was essentially you know girl boy Scouts. They renamed it, and all the the, the dads were like going crazy. Oh my God, we're going to have girls and boy scouts you know like the world is going to end like how is this going to work and now we're a few years into it they just graduated the from from my neighborhood the first all girl boy scouts uh a troop and it's like a complete non-issue you know it's yeah but like, isn't but al cares? isn't that the worst nightmare of the dad you were talking about from 10 years uh, ago? yes <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah but but i mean it really is it's like all this stuff you know it it you you look back on it and and you realize like it, it didn't nearly need to be nearly as complicated as this. that said like I'm I'm not saying I've got any easy answers on on any of this stuff now uh so I, I want to move on to the topics but but real quick I want to go through the top ten because there's actually some news just in the last couple of weeks coming out of the top ten uh, and I'll go through real quickly as we touched on Rhea Ripley number one I think uh, an easy and deserving choice. Uh, number two, Julia. Some talk uh, just over the last week of whether WWE is interested in Julia. And on, on one hand, I think it's like a gimme. It, it, you know, I, I think she's such a talent. And, um, you know, for better or for worse, this is this is still part of it. She's beautiful. She's, she's very attractive. And she has a, a very, like, interesting look. An incredible wrestler in the, in the ring. Not just athletically, but in terms of conveying uh, emotion. Um, so... You know, to me, star written all over her, but yeah. there's that language barrier. That's a real problem. And, 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 well, Asuka's you know, there. I mean, you know, yeah. She's, Asuka, she's we saw Kyrie saying, we see EO. So, so maybe less of a problem than, than before. How much, how much, Brian, do you think it is a problem or has to be a problem? I, I don't think so. I mean, especially there are certain people that can get around it. I think Asuka's found a way to get around it. There have been times where I felt like it has been an impediment for her. But, but partly that's due to the fact that I don't think they were handling her the right way. Like, I don't think you want to lean into making her a comedy act. I don't know. Mm. I think that was a mistake, you know, and I think, unfortunately, that's partly like a Vince McMahon thing where people have said that. Like, he sees wrestlers that can't speak English almost like as a joke. Like, you make them into the butt of a joke because they can't speak English, you know. But as far as with the Julia situation or somebody like that, I mean, I think there's no – the WWE system especially – the look is a major part of it more than even in, let's say an AEW, like the, the look, look, that's why we're talking about. That's a big part of why we're talking about Rhea Ripley. She's got an incredible look. She looks like a star. You look at her, even if you had no idea who she was or what she's done and you just go, Oh, well, this is a star. Obviously you just feel it. Bianca Belair, same thing. She's got a great look. It goes a long way. I mean, people, you could say WWE is more superficial, whatever. They don't care as much about the wrestling, whatever. Those are things that are leveled at them. Look, this is why Jade Cargill is going to be oh, yeah. like, you want to talk about, she's going to be bigger, I'll say it, than any of the women they currently have right now. When, when she gets to the right point, I think she will be. Or at least I think, let me, let me, let me qualify, I think they want her to be. I think they want her to be, for and sure. She could be, but... And a she's big part of that is look because she's yeah. she we know she's not, you know, the most the greatest worker in the world. She's come a long way, a long way. But her look is probably the most important asset that she's got. Look, when she got out of that limo, I forget what it was at their pay-per-view. What was it for uh, one of them? I don't know. Uh, 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 Fastlane. Yeah. Yeah. Fastlane. 
she walked out and and you get people that She's are bigger that than will, triple h but people will people that just <laughs> you know right you got so much wrestling tribalism that sometimes people can't see what's obvious in front of their face she walked out of that limo and you go okay yes uh, th this yeah. is where she belongs yeah. she's immediately a bigger star than she ever was and, and and then but i have people that will say well i don't know what you're talking about she looks exactly the same and i'm like but she doesn't. She doesn't. Like, she, let's be real. They have, they have people crazy, there yeah. that that's what they're that's what they do: makeup, hair, clothes. They tell you how to stand. They tell Ooh. you where to look. I, like I've seen it with my own eyes. They know it's how to do this. It's not a wrestling company. It's an right. entertainment company. And it's a it's a, it's a machine. Matters. They know how to yeah. produce that. Yeah. And so that's why I think like she's another great example of how why the look's so important. So that all I'm saying is like a wrestler like like Julia. Is it Julia or Yulia? However you. It's say Julia, it. I believe. She yeah. she's tailor made for WWE. I think. What, what one thing about this whole discussion of uh, uh, looks and and I know this is like a sensitive topic and and uh, but I'll say this much: like yes, in some ways looks are as important as they've ever been. But it's also, I think, through a real different prism than before because you think oh. about you know when you when you mentioned China years ago. Um, China always, uh, I think was, was challenged in some, it's also what, what, you know, was her bread and butter, but, but she did stick out like a sore thumb because it was just all bikini models. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and there was like a sameness with, you know, very, uh, enhanced and, and a, a certain figure. And, and now, um, when, when you look, you know, even look at a, a Rhea Ripley, uh, uh, mm -hmm. for, for example, uh, the look is amazing, but it's not, you know, it's not conventional. It's no, not, no, she's not. Right. She and, and they sort of did the conventional thing with her and it didn't work. Right. Right. She, like she when, when it like... hit was when she had, she adopted the look that she has now. Right. And mm -hmm. she doesn't, she doesn't look like she walked out of a swimwear catalog or something. Like. Yeah. Yeah. But that, but that's the thing. But, but see that also is part of the equity that needs to happen because here's the thing with the men looks are important too. I mean, your look is important. It's not the same as men and women. They don't, they don't, you don't have to be, you know, the most handsome man in the world. They will find a place for you, but you have to have, especially in WWE, some type of an interesting look, something that makes you stand out. Even like, like Otis, Otis has a great look. Right. I He's was going to say King you know, Kong Bundy. I was just right. watching King a shoot Bundy. interview right. with right. King Kong Bundy. And um, like, yeah, he was all looks, right? I mean, and you, and not, not the most handsome guy in the world, but like, no, you, you, you couldn't help but look at King Kong Bundy. And, right. and um, for for so long, you know, and and there were always like bigger women's wrestlers, but but it was like a freak show. He never like Bertha Fay. I mean, it was sort of like a, a butt of jokes, well, that other, sort of thing. Yeah, but and, the other thing is because of that, because of the the stress being taken off, where everybody needs to look like you know Trish Stratus. There's more opportunities. Like, sure, I, I always couch for uh, uh, well. Uh, I always couch how I say this because I don't want to go like, well, look at this. You know, she's ugly and she's a success. Like, I'm not trying to say that, right? But no, but no. there. But I will say I won't name any names. You can think of whoever's in your head. There are women in wrestling today at very high positions who would not have been given a second look sure. years ago because mm -hmm. they just are not like the perfect ten. Trish Stratus, sable-looking woman. Yeah, and that and that's good. That's a but good thing. But beyond that, I, I will mention Piper or Niven, who I think is beautiful. <laughs> uh, uh, but but I think like once upon a time, she she would have been, she might have gotten a job, but it would have been the freak show, and she would have been it would have been, been fat like jokes. Yes, yes, exactly. And and now it's sort of. You know, I don't even see anybody mention it other than like sh she's imposing, right? She's she's right. like she'll she'll kick your ass, right? Because Nia Jax because is a good like, example. Nia Jax is another example too, oh, and, and, and they're they're been yeah. Yeah. yeah, and they were yeah, right. But they were able to see that they wouldn't have even bothered in the past. She is gorgeous, right. but they would have just said, "Oh, she's too overweight. We can't she yeah. we can't present her as a beautiful woman because of her size." And 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 they were able to actually enhance her and make her look her very best by not having that immediate knee-jerk reaction so yeah the, the number eight we were talking about her briefly um before willow nightingale is is a great example right again uh very pretty you know uh unconventional and um you know i i i think like how it's sold is like this beautiful smile on on a woman who will destroy you right who, who will like <laughs> run through you 
Um, and, and that's great. It's great that there's a place for that now. Uh, one other woman I want to bring up, not in the top 10, but in the news, Ronda Rousey in, in Ooh. Ring of Honor of all places. Uh, a- what, what do you make of that, Patricia? Uh, you know, it, who would have called this? And on, on one hand, it's sort of like good for her. If she likes doing this, yeah. do it wherever like you can, you're going to get enjoyment. On the other hand, it, it's insane to me when, when you go from a few years ago that like they, they built a WrestleMania around and more than one around Ronda Rousey. And she was the, the signing of all signings. And now it's like, eh, she showed up on Ring of Honor for, for a tag team match. It's kind of nuts to me. Yeah, no, same. It is honestly like unbelievable because if you would have told me this was going to happen, like, or if she would show up and bring on, I'd be like, ah, yeah, right. Because um, I have always been like a Ronda Rousey uh, defender. Like, I know, like, she she's at the mercy of wrestling fans. And she's one of those people that never learned how to navigate them. So she is hearing everyone say, like, you know, you didn't you didn't go through the indies or, you know, people don't know how much she actually cares for the wrestling business. So she always kind of got that flack. And then she came back. I thought she was having fun working with like Shayna Baszler and all that kind of stuff. So now she's at a place where it's like, okay, if you guys don't think I'm wrestling, you know, I'm going to do what you guys said that I didn't do. I'm going to go to the indies and work my you know, RH is at the Indies, but I'm going to try out things outside of WWE and hopefully gain respect of like wrestling fans is how I'm thinking she's thinking of it. Um, and at the end of the day, she's Ronda Rousey. She's one of the most elite athletes in the world. She ha- she took women's sports. Honestly, like we can even argue that she is the reason why WWE started the women's evolution. Like it was what Ronda Rousey was doing in MMA to get us to a lot of where we are now. So I always respected her and I always thought it was a huge get for WWE to sign her. Like, you know, like, yes, you know, WWE got her, but it's also like, you know, like that's huge. So but her showing up in Ring of Honor and like a random tag team match is like, you know, there's no buildup. There's no... uh, you know, I think about the first Women's Royal Rumble, which is one of my favorite matches of all time, and, like, how a lot of people were upset that, like, Oscar's win was overshadowed by Ronda yeah. Rousey's appearance. So you go from that to, like, her just popping up, like, on indie shows and stuff like that. It's a dramatic change. But at the same time, I think she just kind of wants to have fun again. Like, I think she just wants to, you know, you know get, you know, ha- participate in combat sports with, with people that she respects and likes and just have fun again and i can see that ultimately getting her back to wwe so like it's very shocking but i'm also just like ronda do your thing yeah 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 i sort of agree i mean it's i feel like she's doing it for the right reasons she just she wants to be out there with her friend uh working on one hand i'm like is tony not tony khan crazy for for not like hyping this ahead of time but then i also think you know that that could have also backfired um, because right. she is so much like the WWE product that if you hype, you know, Ronda Rousey coming to Ring of Honor, there, there might have been some some backlash. You might have not had the the reaction you wanted. So I don't know. Maybe I, I also I think you talked about it, but I didn't hear what he said. Brian, did did he make it clear whether this was like a one off or whether she's going to be a regular now? Um, you know, I'm I'm not sure if he did, but I you know I'm sitting there th- thinking that. There had to be. I'm wondering if there's some type of contractual thing, or uh, so I'm trying to give Tony Khan the benefit of the doubt here because <laughs> you have you're running against SmackDown for the first time ever, and beginning to end of your show is running against the main roster WWE show for the first time ever. Ronda Rousey is in the building. Forget about even if they didn't hype it. You don't put her out there. You don't right. do. You put her on what is essentially, for the from the AEW per point of view, a dark match because it's right. going to be, you know, on Honor Club. What in the? I, I would hope that there's some type of a fine print or something that reason why they did that. Because why in the world would you not at least try to 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 do something that would make people want to switch from SmackDown, which that would make some people. Yeah. Switch. Yeah. I mean, she was a star. She was, she was a draw and, and she's worth something for sure. Yes. 
See, yeah. I have this this theory that like she didn't want that. Like, Maybe, I think, yeah, I I could believe that. That too. could be. Yeah. I that could I think be. She just wants to just get in and wrestle and j- without the hoopla because that's really kind right. Of because then there's the pressure of it's she's got to deliver those right. ratings, right? It's and exactly. and if she doesn't, then she she flopped. When all she wants to do is go out there and you right. know arm bar some people. Right. Yeah. And she can't handle that. Like we've seen it. Like as soon as like her first run, as soon as that crowd turned on her, she didn't know what to do. Yeah, but that's she, always that's been her her you problem. Know yeah. I mean? So then yeah. it's like very you know, thin skin get in and and do my thing and if you know if it, it it turns into this big thing it doesn't if it doesn't it doesn't like i really think right now she just wants to like have fun again yeah yeah uh so while we're while, while we're talking about aw maybe we could transition into some of the news coming out of the weekend and and full gear i think that the biggest news uh being another signing that of, of will osprey and we spent a lot of time in the last podcast brian talking about that where's will gonna end up we now know and um you know, I was pushing for him to join WWE after hearing his explanation. I, I think it makes sense. And, and honestly, for, for all the arguments you can make about what's the best place to for your wrestling career, uh, I will never second guess uh, somebody who makes a decision based on what's best for his family and his kids and his home. And it sounds like that factored in, um, in, in a big way. And so it, it makes all the sense in the world to me. Um, that said, Brian, I mean... Where do you think they go with him? People are already talking Wembley Stadium 2024, uh, all in. Certainly makes all the sense in the world. Um, I I assume they're putting the world title on Will Ospreay uh, at, at some point. Um, do you assume that too? And and does it make sense? I mean, is he that caliber a star? I think, first of all, I think he made the right choice. He's in the right place. And, uh, you know, I, 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 was, I said it before, I think from – from his perspective, and I think even the the place where he would thrive the most, I just think because AEW really does put the premium on on matches and the kind of matches you can deliver, and we know he can do that. Um, I think that's where his strength lies. So, so he's in the place where he's going to succeed the most. Yeah, I, I think at some point, uh, if we get past uh, Super MJF, at some point. <laughs> Uh, he probably will be AEW world champion. Yeah. And I mean, I, I think, I think he's already at the level where fans would accept it. I don't think yeah. you have to like get him there. I think he's there. It's just getting him in the right opportunity to do it. Like it's kind of weird because, well, I guess he, he's sort of a natural heel. So he would work with the new kind of crying MJF they have. So that might, you know, maybe that's the way to go. I'm sensing you're not a huge fan of the, this new MJF character. I don't know. I, you know, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but um, there are people out there saying that they were they're intentionally trying to devalue him so that WWE doesn't want him. Oh my God. <laughs> but I and think I, it's over huge. I mean, I I think he's gotten over huge as a babyface. I'd really kind of like it. You know, I mean, I I, I think it it's sort of like wrestling 101 right that your the, the worst of bad guys can become the most beloved of good yeah. guys and i i think like the 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 line you have to walk is is not completely forsaking the person you were before because it, it just doesn't ring true i think that's why when like roddy piper turned in the 80s it, he got over because he was still a jerk but it he's our jerk now and, and that's kind of like the, the joke that that mjf is making is that you know he's not out kissing babies or hugging he's still like a prick you know but but um uh you know now in an endearing way and i think it's really working for what i just don't know about that media scrum thing i just gotta say i don't i don't yeah. know if that fits into what you're describing because that was not in any way shape or form i didn't see it I didn't, the I'm, old I'm, I'm, mjf where where yeah. he was just crying and so it was almost like i don't know if I, if you guys have had ever seen this but when when Bob Backlund was WWF champion, oh yeah, yeah, and they broke his belt, and right, superstar yeah. Billy Graham <laughs> came back and broke his belt, and and smashed the belt to pieces, and he just started crying on television, you Man know, up. like like a <laughs> child. But it hurt his image. There are people yeah. who say that he never came back from that, and that the fans started to turn on him. And I just don't know. I don't know if I could get with that from a character in his position in that company. Yeah. The, the, because the, the the whole face thing with him, maybe it's because he's such a natural jerk that 
you almost feel like, oh, he's just pretending. There's, I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop here. What is he? What is he up yeah. to? What is he doing? You always feel that underneath, like what? What is he? It's almost like, it, and they could do that, but I also think of like every '80s movie where where the bully, um, you know, ends up being, you know, being redeemed, and uh, then you have like an affection. <laughs> For him, and that's what it feels like, you know, like the 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 bad guy with with kind of you know a heart in there somewhere. So, uh, Patricia, let, let me ask you overall. I don't know how much you saw of it, but but that whole kind of main event angle that began in the pre-show and and carried all the way through the main event with MJF being heard and and the tease of of uh, a bait and switch with Adam Cole and that all that everything that that played out very sports entertainment right for for uh, AEW and because of that you know I, I think a lot of mixed reviews where were you on it I I'm there where I love a good heel like I I want you to be as dastardly as possible like i want you to go all the way in like when he made that kid cry or like threw the drink on that kid like i was i was like that's what you're supposed to do i know um, i agree I do feel, <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> um, um i do feel like it was it was like a bit too much for me like i think like you know it was like a little over mm -hmm. produced or overwritten like i didn't think it needed like all of that um, and I am, I agree with you, Brian, like I'm waiting for that other shoe to drop where it's like, okay, like, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, and then fool us all and do the evil laugh and I'm all the way here for you. I'm like, yes, yes, yes. yes. But what would that be? I mean, you would think it, it's got something to do with Adam Cole, but I think that there is, uh, as much, if not more expectation that the twist is Adam turning on MJF. Um, I honestly would... I mean, that's the most sports entertainment way to go is for Adam Cole to be the one to turn on MJF. But because, you know, I just, I, I want MJF to be the, the, I want him to be a dick for the rest of his career. Like I want him to <laughs> be a jerk. Like, excuse my language, but I don't want to see him. Like, I want this to be all up front. I don't want to, you know, officially be sold on him as a baby face all the way. Like I want him to be like a uh, Roddy Piper where he's always, he's, he never stopped being an asshole. It's just that we grew to love him. So, yeah. But I'm also excited. Like, I want Adam Cole to, I hate, like, I was at that um, show where he got injured. Or his ankle got injured. It was just such Oh, yeah, a, the Grand Slam. I was there, yeah. It was really a freak accident. Like, mm -hmm. he jumped off the thing, and then he started limping. I was like, oh, damn. So, like, I want to see Adam Cole have that big moment. And if turning on MJF is the way to do it, I say go for it. I'm still not totally sold on on Adam Cole as like that guy. You know, I like him, but but I don't know. Sp speaking of uh, uh, overkill, uh, uh, Brian, I'm not about to uh, leave this podcast without asking you about Swerve versus uh, Hangman and what people are talking about it being one of the most violent matches on on American television uh, ever. Where, I mean, when you literally have somebody drinking another person's blood, um, and you know, I've made it clear. I'm not a fan of this stuff. And and I think AEW um, can sometimes really kind of be shooting itself uh, in the foot when, when it goes this far. And you're almost, you know, you're feeding that narrative that WWE has tried to start from day one about this being, you know, the blood and guts company. And and they're not by and large, but when they are, oh boy, are they. I mean, like they, they really go all in and yeah, I don't know. I don't love it. Well, I, I, I just want to say one thing from before I comment on it is that I haven't seen it yet because okay. I was away with my family for the weekend. So uh, I did not get to see full gear. Yet. You've got, you know, barbed wire. You've got. I heard, again, no, I heard all about juice. it. I've seen yeah. pictures. I've seen descriptions and things. Here's the thing. I like to have. I, I like blood in matches. I'll just come out and say it. I like it when it's earned, when. You know, because because to me, if you smash some, there's certain times where you have to have blood or it looks ridiculous. Right. And I think we're so conditioned by WWE that you just kind of shrug your head. But like and no one no one cares. But if you take somebody and you smash their head into a into a ring post or rake their face against a steel cage. Now, if you don't want to have blood in your company, don't do those things, because mm -hmm. when you commit when when a guy you know and that used to be common sense in the business like when you do something like that 
you just you have to have blood because otherwise it looks completely fake. Like you I don't have know if to... I agree because if a guy you know watch you have seen if a guy punches another guy you're you're gonna have blood. I mean it, it, I understand that wrestling you know like but I think all the more reason why it's not though, gonna look real. But all the more reason why when you do something that extreme like when you've got you know them uh, against a hard object like I, I'm just because of my book wrestle my Gorilla Monsoon book right I'm watching a lot of these old pay per views. And, and I'm in the middle of watching WrestleMania 3. And WrestleMania 3 was during the, the first era where WWE had banned all blood. No more blood. But they still, even on that show, they had a spot. And I think it was it was Billy Hercules. Yes, yeah. you know, Hercules and Billy Jack Haynes, where he wraps the chain around his fist and he punches Billy Jack Haynes in the head. Now, if they did that today, there would definitely be no blood. The guy would be laid out. He'd probably pin him, whatever it is. But because it was then, even though they had a no blood rule, it was still the idea of, well, well if we're going to hit somebody in the head with a steel chain, he's got to yeah. bleed. He's just got to bleed. Otherwise, it makes no sense. So this is my roundabout way of saying I'm not squeamish about blood. I think it has a place in wrestling. But I do think that AEW does go a little too far sometimes yeah. because I'm not like, you know, Al, I'm not a fan of the death match stuff. It's not my cup of tea of just where it's just totally just blood for the sake of blood and blood and guts and all that. I think it has a place, but I, I definitely don't, I haven't seen it, I, I, but I can't imagine that there's ever a good time to have anybody drinking anyone else's <laughs> blood. I think I'm going to go out on a limb and say that. And I hope, I really hope that they were both tested before this match. Oh, right you know, and, and the problem with something like this, and, and especially out of AEW, frankly, is that they keep on upping the ante, right? So, so now this is the 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 standard, right? So this is like the the high water mark of of what a hardcore match uh, looks like. So wait until John Moxley's in his next feud, right? And looks back on this and says, "Oh, I'll show you." Oh, you know, I'm, I'm going to fill up a glass. You know? that's, <laughs> and, you uh, have to top you know? it, and that's the yeah. scary part that yeah, you yeah. into. Right, right. Yeah, it's and like the whole top this. And it, it's weird from a, a, a major company, too, like you say, because then you think, like, are you limiting your, you know, because GCW doesn't have to worry about stuff like no, that. They can, right. they can yeah. do what they want. GCW, you know, that's their thing. They're never going to have a major sponsor. They've made their peace with that. That's the kind of company they're running. But you have to wonder, like, do they realize in AEW, like, the consequences of things like that? Are they okay with that? Like, are they yeah. worried that, um, you know, Warner is going to kick them off their networks. I mean, I'll get people that will say to me, well, why do you care about stuff like that? Just be a fan. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm more than a fan. Like I, I write about this industry. Right. I've been, you know what I mean? Of the future of the wrestling business. Like there's a mm -hmm. reason why there's a method to WWE's madness. There's a reason why there's those stupid little rules that Vince had. And that's why they yeah, are a billion right. dollar entertainment company right yeah. now and why aw may not ever get to that point for the reasons that we're talking about you know a, a little microcosm of this conversation is what we just saw with the nwa right and and mm -hmm. billy corrigan where they were right there right you know uh, uh about to sign with with cw and they have the brilliant idea and and look there's going to be debate about whether this is the full story or not but but what we know happened did happen factually is they they did an angle with cocaine on a pay per view, and then mysteriously there's a hold up on on the TV deal, and and that's where like I, th I think it's what you're touching on, Patricia. It's like this is where you got to be major league, right? And like maybe you don't do things like that, you know, like yeah. no better. Um, speaking of major leagues, let, let's transition to the the, the next big uh, a show uh, coming. This Saturday Survivor Series, always one of my favorites of the years because it's there's just sort of kind of like a nostalgia attached to, to Survivor Series Thanksgiving week. Um, you know, th they've moved away from the, uh, the 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 four man or five man elimination matches. And actually was at Survivor Series last year and went to the, the press conference. And it's the question I got to ask Triple H was, you know, does this mean we're done with the the, the, the elimination matches? And he said, no, you know, well. If there's a, a, a place for them, you know, we'll come back. And, and he also, at the time, wasn't committing to Survivor Series now being about war games. But but pretty clearly it is. And I'm here for it. I think it's fantastic. That said, I'd be interested in, in both your thoughts, but I'll start with you, Patricia. I mean, any issues with um, kind of how contrived it is that right around Survivor Series time, just by happenstance, 
there are two feuds involving factions, four on four factions, and the only place to settle it is is inside of War Games. I, I mean, I'll, I I say that as a setup. Yes, it is kind of contrived, but I'll also point out that I think WWE, um, to to their credit, did lay the groundwork uh, in in building up Judgment Day over two years as like this powerful faction where it's believable that that you know they would have beef with a whole bunch of people because of, of everything they're doing and to a, something of a lesser extent damage control on, on the women's side that have not been as dominant but they exist they're there and so it makes sense that they would be in a group feud i really enjoyed um both the war games matches uh last year they were so different one of them a lot more uh, kind of brutality and the athleticism on the women's side, ironically, and then the men's side, really storyline driven with the developments with with Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens, and I'm I'm really excited about oh, this weekend. That was a year ago. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So what what, I, what are you thinking about this year? So I I loved War Games. I loved when it was an NXT. I think it, like especially the women, they just like bring it, and it kind of goes back to the tradition of Survivor Series matches where there's there's feuds and and you have to build teams to kind of, mm -hmm. you know, it was like captain versus captain. And then it was like, right. whoever the kind of evolution of that, yeah. are, whoever the heels are, okay, now we're going against each other. But I think now it's a little bit more interesting because it's not just that. It's not just like a team of baby faces, a team of heels. It's like, who was dominant? And now we got to gather everybody and like beat them in the most brutal match possible. So like, to me, it's kind of like elevating the 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 vein of the traditional Survivor Series match. Like, and I'm speaking for Chris to be my my partner of Survivor Series. It's her favorite pay per view because so much so much history has happened at Survivor Series. You know, like the Rock debuting and like all that stuff. So I love that there's a fresh take on it because mm -hmm. you know when it turned into like brand versus brand, it was like you guys don't even care about the brand. That never worked. Yeah. So why do we care about brand supremacy now? So I think this is honestly one of like the best ways to go about it and also to utilize a lot of different people. Like we got Becky and Charlotte back together. Yeah. I don't know if there's anything else that could have like, you know, storyline wise that would have made the most sense where it's not like, okay, yeah, I just want this to happen. Like, no, no, no. It makes sense that Becky's joining this team. So I'm, I'm here for it. I'm so excited for it. Um, I think it makes sense that, you know, parts of the roster want to get back at the team that's been like dominating them all year. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. How about you, Brian? You excited for Survivor Series? I think what they did is a step in the right direction, definitely. I mean, yeah, I, I was at the last Survivor Series where it was still brand versus brand uh, from 2020, where they had Roman Reigns versus Big E in the main event. Oh, Brooklyn, yeah, I was there, yeah. And that was probably the most boring show oh, I had ever awful. been to. I think it was live. 21. <laughs> yeah, it was 2021, and yeah, it was 21. Really you're right, yeah. 21. And But for was, Charlotte and Becky, that was really good. Yes, I mean, and the crowd even, they were bored out of their mind. I don't know if you got that sense too. People were yeah. turning on the show. They were, there was a chant at one point that Randy Orton was sleeping. I don't know if he really was, but he looked like he was sleeping on, that, yeah. on the rope and they were going, Randy sleeping, you know. Oh, and, remember and the so, stupidity of it was that they were, um, the, the whole night was promoting the Rock's 25th anniversary yes. or something. And, then, like, and he was never there. <laughs> it was yeah. very sad. It was sad. It was like it they was were like just like, movie commercial that's yeah that's yeah it's it was, idiotic yeah it the was, egg that was the egg, yeah, right? the, the egg. Oh, the egg. Like, which by the way <laughs> i don't i don't know if, <laughs> i don't know if you got the sense but i mean maybe you were more tuned in than me but being there live we had no idea what the hell was going on with that egg <laughs> thing like oh, what is it with survivor series and eggs it didn't come across <laughs> at all so yeah no i i think it's a step and to change it up is good. The ironic thing, which is hilarious to me, I don't know if you remember this, but when Survivor Series started, right, in 87, it started a few months. The first one was a few months after War Games was introduced in the right. NWA. So War Games was introduced in the summer of 87, the Great American Bash Tour. And the buzz about Survivor Series and I didn't really know this at the time because I was I was still a little kid. But in later years, just like reading up, the buzz was that it was this idea like WWF is going to come back and do their own. Like we just had this high concept gimmick match that the NWA came up with. Now WWF is going to answer it with like 
sort of like a non-violent version of that. You know, how can we do a high concept match with teams against teams, which isn't as brutal? Like that's literally what they were going for, which is more child friendly. And they came up with Survivor Series. And now they've gone. Now Survivor Series has become War Games, which is a, a strange wow. irony. But well, but that way, would have happened under Vince's watch. No, I mean, that, it definitely that was would. Very much the Triple H influence. Yeah, I, I I enjoy. I love War Games. My my gripe about, and I'm not going to talk about blood again. I know Al, you think I'm like a bloodthirsty <laughs> maniac. We'll put. The, well, let's set the blood aside. Even setting the blood aside, you can still do a good War Games match, but. My only gripe is that I think they rely too much on weapons and props. Like, yeah, it, it becomes too much where it's like now the crowd expectation is they get in the ring and immediately there's just piles of sticks and tables and chairs. And and it's almost it, to me, it almost makes me think, like, do they not are they do they have trouble laying out like what are we going to actually do in this match? And so they just go, well, if we have a bunch of props, then we can just sort of like we can figure yeah. it out. Like there's so much more they can do with the actual physicality of and, the and the double ring, double cage. You know that 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 right. as a prop. That's what I loved about those old war games was the use of the, of the double cage. The, the and cage the one that I enjoyed the most was um, a Sting Squadron and the Dangerous Alliance back the best in, one. in '92, where yeah. I forget who it was, but they, they shoved somebody's head between the the two rings because there's that gap between the two rings and it was just the craziest spot or you'd have people you know uh, pulling themselves themselves up by the roof of the cage or they'd be wrestling on top of the roof of the cage and that's what made it you know so much fun was was using that but yeah now it's you know it's the kendo sticks and it's the tables and all that stuff and and it's fine i, I was iffy about them uh taking the the roof off uh, but I'm sold on it now because that's one of the cooler things they could do is all the the, the yeah. spots off of the top of the the double cage. Um, yeah. So they're, they're I mean it just from like a wow factor. It's one of the highlights of the years because because you know that they're going to pull out some some crazy spots. But also I don't think they get you know, kind of going back to the the AW conversation. By and large, they don't get to the point where where I'm uneasy watching them. You know, um, right. they they are. They're safe, dangerous wrestling spots if there is such a thing. Uh, one, one more thing on on War Games and 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 Raw is airing as as we're doing this, so I, I don't know that anything has happened yet. But certainly the rumor is Randy Orton part of the uh, the, the the men's team. Randy Orton's been gone for a year and a half, something like that now. Uh, I'll ask you, uh, Patricia. You know, the, the, both about this match and just generally Randy Orton's return. How important is this? How much? Of uh, not that they need that much of a boost. WWE is doing really great, uh, but but what does the return of Randy Orton mean for WWE? Um, I I personally just miss him. <laughs> so on a personal note, I would love to see him come back. Right for for this especially, and then because you know he's Randy Orton, like him being that surprise guest, you know that he's gonna bring something to the table. Like he's gonna be, you know, the apex predator. Like he's gonna be physical and mean something to, you know, whichever side that he ends up being on. Um, but, you know, if he doesn't come back, it's not going to be like when The Rock didn't show up to the 25th anniversary of Survivor Series. It's like, womp, womp. Um, yeah. Because, you know, I think going into it, they have a great story. I think the teams, are, you know, it makes sense that they're going against each other. I also just love the, the comedic, pairing of of everyone like Cody and Sammy and you know and Jay and all of the history that they've had like it doesn't necessarily need Randy Orton but it would be nice and also I'm going to be in Chicago so oh really yeah I'm jealous so it's like please show up <laughs> <laughs> yeah how, oh, Brian how about you you know Randy's back or, or, or do you immediately start thinking you know, is it a world title match at WrestleMania? He, he's a big, big star. And it's one of these absence makes the heart grow fonder kind of things, right? Because, right. We, you know, when we last saw him, he was half of a of, of kind of a comedy act tag team and was having fun. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Randy Orton is, is as big a, a name in wrestling as WWE's had in, in the last 20 years or so. Yeah, and it's hard to create a scenario like this. And, I mean, I'm not saying that it's good that anybody got get, gets hurt or is on the shelf or anything. And we know he's had serious back issues that he's been dealing with. But it's like these are the rare opportunities in today's wrestling where you don't get as many surprises as you used to. I mean, now that you've got the two major companies, that's gotten a little more interesting. But so it's 
it's always good when somebody is freshened up to the point where they can come back and it can be exciting and they could be in a new place from where they were before. You know, Randy Orton is a main event star, but he's also the classic example of somebody who spent their entire career in the WWE system without ever going anywhere else. And now he's been on the main roster 21 years. And, you know, it's a challenge to keep people fresh like yeah. that. You know what I mean? Like, that's a challenge that companies never had to face before. So there have been times in those years where he has been as stale as anything. And so, yeah. but now is not one of those times. And I think it's a great moment for him where they could bring him back. I don't know about WrestleMania, but I definitely could see him running up against Roman Reigns. I, has that even been done? I don't think it has. No, that was the plan, I think, before he got hurt, right? They, they were seemed to be building to, uh, they ended up doing Roman and Brock again because Randy was right. out. But, right, but all right, signs right. were pointing to Roman and Randy at SummerSlam uh, last year. So, Absolutely. yeah, I Ro mean, I don't Roman think needs, be... he needs things like that, Roman Reigns. I mean, that's. But, I, but to me, the more obvious one is Seth, right? I mean, like, Seth needs a, a, a big name opponent going yeah. into WrestleMania. So, I think a Randy or and Seth Rollins match has some marquee value, you know, for. I for, agree. Uh, WrestleMania. I only bring up Roman Reigns because he's the one that we know seems to have like this shortage of challengers yeah. where he's just run through everybody. So, where, where with Seth, it's like he's the fighting champion. With Roman, it's more like any time there's an opportunity. You need somebody, yeah, yeah. Right, I'm always like, plug that guy in because sure. we haven't done him yet. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, last thing on, on Survivor Series, uh, uh, Patricia, you're going to be there. One to 100, where do you put the chances of a CM Punk appearance in Chicago? Zero. Zero. Yeah, so, yes. so you're not holding out any hope at all. No, I, I also I'm just like over it. Like I'm over <laughs> him. You know what I mean? Like if he shows up, that's fun. Like, but if like why does every like Chicago is a city that existed before <laughs> so, Like why does everything have to be that? And like and I like that he's playing into it as well. Like he's hinted at things too, but I think he should just leave the wrestling business alone for now. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How about you, Brian? You think there's any chance? I, I really don't, but I will say I, I actually would like to see that. I think it would be it would be very cool to see him get that last run there. Uh, and there's so many possibilities now and and but yeah, I mean, my thing on it is there's there's there really is no secret in wrestling that could be that well kept. I, I just think like if, yeah. uh, if that was something that was going to be happening, there would be way more rumbling than there is now, especially when you hear things like them, like outright denying that there's anything going on. Like they don't really go that far. You, you know what I mean? Like I know that Cody was somebody that they weren't even really trying that hard to keep secret, sure. but I feel like something this massively huge, there would be, at least hints and i'm not talking about manufactured hints where they put something on the t right. you know i mean like real hints and there and there has been none absolutely zero hints but devil and i agree basically but devil's advocate if if you wanted it to be a real surprise then this you know what we're feeling now is what it it should be right yes. because whether it was cody at wrestlemania a couple of years or or aj styles or ronda rousey you know, these big debuts over the the last several years you're right i mean in all cases there were leaks and it wasn't a complete surprise when they happened but also because of that it, it took edges the other one I, I could think of at the rumble years ago and and it took something away i mean if you really wanted to maximize that pop it, it would have to be this level of of a guarded secret not that i think it's going to happen because i don't think it's going to happen but I, but but i'd say it's a non zero chance I and mean, i'd say 1% all right, no, i don't know all right non zero i'll give you that but here's the thing if if it does happen and it's this quiet and this really truly shocking i it would literally be the best kept secret that they've ever done at that level since the internet started you know what i mean <laughs> no i mean i'm not well, saying it's yeah, impossible but it would have to be the single greatest best kept secret of the last 25 years i think the other complication is randy orton right so and and i don't know if if randy's coming out tonight in which case you know um it, it, it wouldn't be a surprise on saturday but if randy was a surprise on saturday i don't think you'd do randy and punk right i mean that would because you know, yeah. one would kind of lessen the other one. But but yeah. Patricia, do you do you at least expect Patricia um uh CM Punk chance inside the oh, building? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Wrestling fans 
they're they gonna do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that'd be interesting. Yeah. yeah. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much. Uh, 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 before we run, uh, uh, Patricia, why don't, why don't you tell people where they can find your podcast and anything else you're working on? Sure. Um, so you can find the Wrestling Girls on YouTube, Patreon, everywhere you listen to your favorite podcasts. You can follow me uh, on Instagram and Twitter at Queen Three Underscores PR. Also, look out for a new show that I am testing with the US Sun called Top of the Rope T. Um, and that is released every week on Sun Sport YouTube channel. And we have a lot of fun stuff brewing in the Those Wrestling Girls universe. So follow us everywhere. Excellent. And, and Brian, uh, what do you got going on? You want to tell, tell people about? Sure. Well, I've got my podcast, Shut Up and Wrestle, which right now I'm right in the midst of, especially when this is out, of a two part episode with Mike Semper Vivi breaking down the Wrestling Observer Hall of Fame ballot for this year. So uh, we've got that. I've got Dave LaGreca coming up as a guest. Um, so and that's suawpod.com. It's my old school wrestling podcast or wherever you get podcasts. And my book for the update, Irresistible Force, The Life and Times of Gorilla Monsoon. I am I am knee deep in writing. I'm in chapter two right now. And, uh, you know, it's moving along now. This is my favorite part of the process because it's the easiest part, the actual writing. <laughs> so it's moving along. I'm very excited. Can we like pre 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 order it or is it still uh, too no. early? <laughs> I, I, I love when people are like, where can I order it? And I'm like, sir, <laughs> sir, I haven't written it yet. I have to write the book first. Yeah. So no, it's, there's no, I don't even have an official publication date yet. Like I told you, I just know the manuscript is due in May, but that could mean anything. Like oh God, the whole, pressure. The whole, I know, I know. I don't know if I make <laughs> it, if I make it, if I, let me put it, I hope ECW press isn't listening to this. If I don't need an extension, it would be the first time ever of any book <laughs> I've ever written. So we'll see. But yeah, but I, I mean, I, you know, we'll see. P Patricia and I both being in, in the uh, uh, journalism uh, business, I think you give these deadlines with full expectation that, you know, they're there to be broken, right? I, so you you say May, knowing that you're not idea. making May. <laughs> yeah, but every time I try to pad it, I try to learn my lesson and yeah. go, you know, let me think about how much time I would need. And then I I'm, add six months to it. Sure. I'll do yeah. that, I mean, that's, and I, but and I think editors know that too. It. Yeah, I yeah, know. yeah. But if you were to give in May, then the same thing would be happening, but with a later, a later uh, deadline. So yeah, anyhow. I know. Uh, anyway, we're excited about it. For, for once, I've got a plug because I didn't do it earlier, and that is Pro Wrestling Illustrated, um, the the latest issue, the Women's Two Hundred and Fifty on newsstands now, and you can get it, of course, at pwi-online.com. And I think any day now. It took us so long to do this episode talking about the Women's Two Hundred and Fifty. The tag team 100 is about to drop if it hasn't by the time you're listening to this. Uh, November 23rd, a digital edition. So, yeah, I think that is uh, next week. Uh, very excited about that. That one's my baby, the tag team list, um, and worked really hard on that. But uh, you don't want to miss any of these. And the tag team issue has got the ballot for the year-end awards mm -hmm. issue. So more reason to pick that up. You could get all of them over at pwi-online.com. And, of course... Best thing to do is subscribe. Um, don't miss an issue and get a uh, deep discount off the cover price. Guys, thank you so much. Patricia, we'll do it again Hi. soon. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Brian, as always, it's been a pleasure. And uh, we will see everybody soon.